PayPal has a new dad, and his name is Alex. You're listening to Motley Fool Money. I'm Ricky Mulvey, joined today by Jason Moser. Jason, good to see you. Hey, Ricky, good to see you. How's everything? It's going pretty well. How about for yourself? You know, I, I could complain, but nobody ever wants to hear it anyway. No, I want, I want you to compl- I want you to complain. Let's we got I'm not five complaining. minutes of, of JMO complaints. All is well. All is well in the neighborhood. We had a successful Halloween, and you know, now we're kicking off uh, Thanksgiving month. You know, and so I'm excited to get that bird on the Traeger this year. Well, speaking of kicking things off, PayPal has a new CEO, Alex Chris. Thirty days on the job. I'm not going to ask you to judge his performance. He hasn't really, he can't really do anything in 30 days. Yeah. But yesterday was his first earnings call. Gave investors a first impression. What was what was your take on Alex's first impression to the to the PayPal shareholders? I, I I'm I'm optimistic. I mean, I I really feel like we've got someone in in the CEO uh, office there that is is aware of the potential that this business has, but also is aware of some of sort of the the unforced errors that they've committed kind of along the way that have that have uh, the market really looking at this thing you know more glass half empty right now. His feelings regarding the business and it, it seems. You know, we we talked about this in, in production, right? The word "focus" was used a lot, um, and I think that's we could argue that the company has probably lacked focus here over the last several years as it's tried to, you know, reinvent itself and become that super app that we heard Shulman always talking about. Really, you know, at the end of the day, that that didn't seem like it was the wisest move. So they're whittling down the cost structure, focusing uh, more on what they do well, which is payments. Um, and I think that uh, his awareness of, of some of the concerns in the investing community uh, is encouraging. I mean, I think you know one of the things we got uh, on, on that call yesterday was a clear admission that that they are not they're not giving us the key performance indicators that tell us how this business is doing. Right? It's been a difficult we've, it's been difficult to judge this business because you know the 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 information is just not so granular. We didn't get that level of granularity that, that I think a lot of us are looking for. It sounds like uh, it sounds like that's getting ready to change, which is a good thing. Yeah, I will note that Shulman was thanked quote for his diligence and professionalism on handing the reins over. Absolutely nothing on the past leadership from uh, from the new CEO Alex Chris, and and he did talk about the the key performance indicators. You tell me how big of a problem was this for PayPal? This is the quote. I believe in the last several years, it has been difficult to model our company consistently because the company itself hasn't provided consistent metrics to allow you to do so. That is going to change. End quote. You follow, You're an analyst. You follow PayPal. What are the metrics you need to see out of the the new form of the leadership? Well, I think ultimately it, it's. You know, PayPal today is much different than it was, you know, years ago. I mean, this isn't just some app where you just, you know, send money to your friends. I mean, this is a, it's a big and somewhat complicated business. I mean, you've got PayPal and Venmo and Braintree. There's branded, there's unbranded. This growing focus, obviously, on small to medium-sized businesses uh, or SMBs. You hear them, hear them uh, talk about. And, and so, I, I think you know, it's been a problem for a while. The the lack of these key performance indicators really giving us, uh, you know, a way to judge their their success and their progress. Um, you know, this isn't just, hey, we're looking at gross dollar volume being pushed through the network anymore. I mean, each facet of the business, right, plays its own role. And so I think getting those KPIs, getting those those metrics where we can gauge the success of each part of this business is going to be, it's going to be extremely helpful. I mean, I, I know I'm not the only one. I think it's been a very common sort of complaint in the investing community is just, you know, not being able to really to really judge their their Progress or or lack of, and now I mean you know it feels like we're going to be able to, to look under the hood as you know at, at each of these drivers of this business and understand more the levers that they can pull with PayPal or with Venmo or what you know what is happening with Braintree and and, and uh, you know branded versus unbranded uh, you know we're going to see you know big focus on this this PayPal complete. Uh, payment solution that, that was a big theme of the call as well. So I, I think that you know next quarter is going to be very enlightening from that from that perspective. I'm looking forward to it. 
Yeah, we got 18 mentions of the word focus, and that was just in the opening remarks for Alex Chris. He is <laughs> go- he is going to repeat that into your skull. He also had a couple innovations that he wanted to highlight. Are and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the menu, and then you tell me if any of these are really worth investors' attention. Number one, we got a cashback credit card. Number two, a unified PayPal rewards program. 25 million users in the past 12 months. They've also highlighted easier sign-in experiences, reduced friction, and then number four, JMO, the first regulated stable coin by a global payments company in which <laughs> which connects PayPal and Venmo accounts. Let's go, crypto's back. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm not the biggest crypto guy, so <laughs> I'll, I'll just uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll decline to really comment much on that. I, it, to me, it seems like they're taking just a measured approach in, in in whatever crypto aspirations they have. So that's a good thing, I think. Uh, not going all in. I, th- I think with PayPal, I mean, it, reducing friction is always is always key. And, and you know, it's frustrating if you are going through checkout, for example, and then you know you get to that last. You know that last step, and and your you, how how you want to pay isn't necessarily supported. So I think reducing friction. You know they've opened up now to where they are part of the Apple wallets and Google wallets. Um, again, that that PayPal complete payment solution I think is going to be something that really ultimately reducing friction that, that creates longer, stickier relationships with with consumers. And hey, I mean, listen, everybody loves rewards, right? I think a unified PayPal rewards program that that makes a lot of sense too. You know, you you kind of uh, for heavy users. Of the service, I mean that that's something that keeps you coming back for more. All right, we also got Airbnb earnings, but anything you want to hit? Anything else you want to hit from from PayPal before we move on? No, no, I'm just. Uh, I think I, you know this was a great introductory uh, quarter. I think for new leadership, and and I think next quarter is really what we're what we're looking forward to because we're going to get a better idea of exactly. How they're going to take this business forward? I think it's you know it's worth noting too the sale of that that happy returns business to UPS. Uh, that I think is a good example of of focus, right? Get rid of these things that just don't have much to do with your core business. And thankfully, you know they sold that to UPS and they actually they actually made a little money on that deal. So uh, so uh, you know, good outcome there. All right. Investors tended to be a little, or they're a little tepid about Airbnb's latest quarter. It's got revenue of $3.4 billion. That is up 18% year over year. Adjusted net income of $1.6 billion. That is the highest ever. Its active listing supply, the number of houses, condos, rooms, grew at about a 20% clip. That's an extra million places to stay. And then they also announced $500 million in stock repurchases over the quarter. What do you think is worth highlighting? Well, you know, I, I understand the. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty out in the world right now, right? And I mean, this is truly a global business. So I think when you look at cross border, for example, the, the nights booked, uh, cross border nights booked increased 17 percent a quarter. They actually called out Asia Pacific having, having fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels. So I think you know, from a global perspective, you look at the opportunity that they're pursuing in travel. I mean, the tourism industry is is greater than two trillion dollar opportunity. Now, obviously, that's not you know. Airbnb's total market opportunity, but it just goes to speak to how large of an opportunity this is, and and so I think you see this business ebb and flow a little bit as it's kind of figuring out its place in the world. Uh, you know, I mean, we've we've talked a lot about the the headline risk with with New York City and this. Uh, what was it? The the local law that they passed through essentially banning yeah. short term short term rentals and, and that's something that uh you know it was it was a headline but it wasn't something that was terribly you know fundamental to their business. I think they said it represented maybe one percent of overall revenue. And it, it does feel like they're they're finding their way in this in this world, kind of like we saw uh with Uber, you know, back in the day when it was really getting established. So I, I think for me, you know, looking at this from the global perspective, I understand uh sort of the 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 hesitation, uh, or you know, the concerns, at least in regard to the forward-looking guidance, there because you know, international travel right now is a little bit of a riskier proposition than it has been in the past. But all things considered, I mean, this is, I mean, it's a very important business. I, I, I do believe if they shut their doors tomorrow, I mean, the the world would feel it. And so, to me, nothing really other 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 to point out than uh, maybe getting a little bit more uh, insight into what they want to do with their experiences uh, next week. I think they have their big uh, their big winter release, and so we'll get some more information there as to you know updates they've made and and uh, sort of the strategy that they're taking with that experience inside of the business because that can be a very complimentary one. 
Yeah, Chesky talking about um, cities opening the doors to Airbnb a little bit more. I think San Diego was one of them. Of course, that's not going to grab the headlines quite like one uh, shutting off Airbnb. But yeah, the experiences thing is a little bit of a concern, Jason. We're That's the plan for New York City. And before the show, we're doing research. And there are experiences in New York City that look lovely. You can have a tea tour. They have comedy shows. There's someone that'll yell at you while you walk across the Brooklyn <laughs> Bridge with them. But a lot of the business and experiences, or a good chunk of it, does seem to be people taking photos of you in front of oncoming traffic. I guess, what is what is your message to those experienced buyers that would like those photo shoots in Times Square in front of oncoming traffic? I just make sure your insurance policies are up to date. Get, you know, <laughs> take out a little bit more if you need it because that sounds like an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> and last thing, I think that Airbnb hasn't really approached yet but makes a lot of sense for the business is a loyalty program. Yeah. Chesky told Bloomberg that they're thinking about it, but it really wouldn't have anything to do with like points or free stays, saying, quote, it would probably be more novel than a standard points program, not like a subsidy program, which is what most programs are, but something where when you use it, the service actually gets better. I don't know what that means. Yeah, it's difficult to it's difficult to say. I mean, you know, you you're getting rewards by virtue of the card that you're using to pay for your Airbnb stays. So I you know I Maybe there's like you know the Airbnb power users. I mean, maybe this gives you free upgrades or or you know maybe maybe you get to waive the cleaning fee or something. I don't know. It sounds like they have to give that give that one a little bit more thought. Um, but you know, loyalty programs they pay off. You know, you're giving people a reason to keep using and to keep coming back. So as long as they as long as they they execute it thoughtfully, it, it seems like it has some potential. All right, let's finish off with a little bit of mailbag. We got an X or a post or, or a tweet or a, a message on the platform formerly known as Twitter from at Taylor underscore Franklin. We'll ask you this, Jason. Does every lifelong investor regrettably go through a quote, I should buy an airline stocks phase? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the longer that you uh, the longer that you invest, the I mean, sure, you, you know, the more success you witness, but but the more mistakes you make, right? I mean, and that's it's it's a never ending learning experience. And um, yeah, airline stocks are funny. I mean, I, I'm assuming this is not just focused on airline stocks, but that's probably an easy one because you know, I, I think historically that's been a pretty tough investment. I think Warren Buffett's got some pretty good quotes out there on investing in airlines, and even he flip flopped and decided he needed to get into into airline stocks at some point. But yeah, I think we all go through that, and and and. The key is to just make sure that you're aware of it and that you learn from it. Like, you know, Ricky, we just got through with this big SPAC phase, right? I mean, we all probably uh, suffered a little bit from that from that SPAC phase. I know I did. App Harvest, uh, you know, where are you now? That was that was a dumb investment on my part. But you know, hey, listen, I learned from it, and uh, and so yeah, I think that uh, I think the key is embracing the fact that you're going to go through those phases and 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 learning from them and and being able to identify that and saying okay well it feels like I'm in this phase and the last time I went through a phase what did I learn should I just avoid going through this phase is it just a phase you know it's I, th I think that's really the key is just always keep an open mind as as an investor and and just uh embrace the learning opportunities because that's what they are Jason Moser thank you for your time and your insight you got it thank you The analysts you hear on the show, well, they have a whole other day job, providing premium coverage and recommendations for The Motley Fool's suite of stock investing services. We're giving our listeners a discount on Motley Fool's flagship service. It's called Stock Advisor. So, if you're interested in more analysis from our team, two stock recommendations per month, and access to Stock Advisor's full scorecard of companies, visit fool.com slash MFM discount. I will also include a link in the show notes. All right, when a stock drops 75%, is it time to order up or are things toast? Up next, Mary Long talks with Tim Byers about a beaten up restaurant tech stock. So, to kick us off, I think I should admit my biases up front because when I go to sit down at a restaurant, I have a nice meal, and then at the end, the check arrives in the form of a little white box that I'm supposed to tap my credit card onto. I turn into a curmudgeon Luddite-like version of myself. The point is, I don't want to like Toast. So, what am I missing? Is Toast anything besides a point-of-sale system? 
It is. It, it solves what I, I often call a migraine level problem. Uh, and what I mean by a migraine level problem is if you have a headache, aspirin is, is nice, but sometimes you can go to sleep and ride it out. But if you have a migraine, you will pay whatever is required in order to get relief for that migraine. And so I like to be investing in companies that solve migraine level problems because they tend to have things like pricing power. They tend to have a little bit of a competitive advantage. And in the case of Toast, the migraine level problem here is that if you're a restaurant operator, you do need to be investing in everything from the point of sale system to managing, ordering, reservations, integrating with delivery systems, managing your payroll, managing just a, a bazillion things. There's a lot of digital systems that you need to be invested in and which need to be integrated. And so you can do really one of two things. You can hire somebody who will get the tech for you and then integrate it all for you. Or you can go with Toast, which has what I would call a full-scale restaurant operating environment. They give you all of the things that you need for the tech infrastructure for a restaurant, which is very attractive if you're a restaurant operator, particularly if you're a restaurant group that has, say, like five to up to 20 locations. You get all the point of sale systems, you get all the hardware, then you get all the software, you get all of the integrations. And so the way Toast charges is they will charge you something for that hardware and they do charge a subscription fee. But the key feature here that is a win win for the restaurant and really a win 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 for the restaurant restaurant, the wait staff, and Toast itself is what's called the fintech side of the business, where they are taking a slice, a small slice, about 50 to 55 basis points off of the fees that are generated through just the business that runs through the restaurant. So, as the restaurant does more business, Toast makes more money. As the restaurant makes more money, Toast makes more money. And as the restaurant makes more money and turns tables faster, those wait staff are happier too because they're getting more tips. They might be getting bigger tips. So, a lot of people win by putting Toast in place. And that's something I very much like about this business. I, I think the massiveness of that migraine is reflected in the fact that the restaurant business is pretty notoriously tough. I, the National Restaurant yep. Association reports that just 20% of restaurants actually make it past the five-year mark. And then for those that do succeed, margins are famously slim. Do you think that that high failure, low margin combo, does that affect Toast prospects at all? It does, but it also provides a, an ever-refreshing pool. This is something that is true about every company, and you, you know the names because they're Motley Fool picks that deals with small businesses of any sort. So, let's talk about HubSpot. Let's talk about Shopify. These are businesses that cater to a sector of industry where the churn rate is high because the failure rate amongst small businesses is high. And that would be a really big problem if there weren't always new concepts, new small businesses being created. And in the case of the restaurant business, there's always Always a new restaurant concept, Mary. I mean, there there have been so many of these, and that will always be true. We will always find ways to go out and have a good dining experience, whether we're talking about quick serve or, in the case of really the core of Toast customers, is a sit down experience. Just you know, maybe have a bottle of wine, a good meal, and we're talking primarily about that type of restaurant and restaurant group where it's an owner that is not a massive chain. There, there are maybe two or three different proprietors who came together, had a concept, and wanted to build something, and they've gotten to like ten locations. And those are the people who have really no interest in the entrenched play here, which is Micros, which was acquired by Oracle, been around for years, and they have not been all that modern, and they've been much more of a point solution. And so, Toast has been taking share from them. And for those that have been around for a while, Micros has been a big target and Toast has been getting a lot of business replacing those micros point of sale systems. And I think that's probably going to continue. This is still an early stage company. Revenue has been growing at a good clip, but Toast has yet to turn any net, net income. 
I, third quarter earnings for the year come out next week, but long term, what kind of returns do you expect to see from Toast in the next five, 10 years? And what do you think it needs to do to actually get there? Well, there's a number of things that it needs to do to get there. The main there's a couple of main drivers for for Toast. The first is number of locations and in the latest quarter, I'm just checking my numbers here. If I I look at it in the last quarter that ended June 30th, they were up to 93,000 locations. Now, Toast has said that their addressable market in the US is a bit over 800,000 US restaurant locations. Across the world, they think that addressable market, and they are going international, that can be over 20 million. So, locations are a big part of this. They want to multiply the number of locations they can get into. And they're doing a very good job of, of doing that. So, just for comparison's sake here, Mary, from June 30th, 2023 to June 30th, 2022, that's from 68,000 in the year prior quarter up to 93,000. So, adding 25,000 locations in a year. Year, that is an impressive number. So, what we're hoping when we see in the current quarter is more growth in locations. But really, what we want to see in addition to that is steady, steady growth upwards in terms of revenue per location, profit per location, and total business that these restaurants are doing. And I think if they continue on the trajectory they're continuing on, Mary, they can get to a place where they're generating about a 15 to 16 percent free cash flow margin. Get to about two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand locations, and if they get there at the rate they're growing the revenue they earn per location, this is a company that can generate twenty percent plus average annual returns over several years, maybe even up to a decade. That's a lot. A lot of things need to go right. They're going to be subject to things like macroeconomic conditions consumer spending. So this will not be linear, but the the seeds are there for this to be a very successful growth company over the next several years. In spite of that growth in number of locations that you mentioned, the stock is down nearly 75% from the high that it hit of $65 per share, which happened right after yep. its IPO. Do you see that as a product of these macro level conditions and kind of things that you just mentioned or is there another reason why the market is valuing this company so differently? The valuation needed to reset. I mean, let's just be honest. They came out the gate in their IPO, and they were valued way too richly, way too early. And the valuation had to come back to normal. And so, now, it has come back down to a much more rational level. I would call this stock pretty fairly priced and potentially cheaply priced if the growth holds up. But I wouldn't call it cheap on a pure basis because it's not yet profitable. But I think it is priced for very good growth over the long term. But initially, Mary, it was vastly overvalued coming out the gate. And and so, the market has reset the pricing here. Now, more recently, what's driven down the price are a couple of things. First, the flub. With you know putting on digital orders, they decided to try to put on a 99 cent digital ordering fee onto every toast order that was a digital order, and that went over like a lead balloon. That did not work well, and they had to admit the error and backtrack from that, which I think was the right thing to do. And then the other, I think, is a pretty big misunderstanding about a CEO transition. So Chris Comparato who had been the CEO and had worked with the founding team for a really long period of time, including at their prior company, it was time for him to move on to become executive chairman. And the CEO is not somebody who's coming in from the outside. This is a founder. This is you know, uh, Anam Narang, who has served in a number of different operational roles for Toast. Like he helped lead sales early on in the company's life. This is somebody who's been training for a step up to the CEO role almost since day one. He still owns a fair amount of stock in the company. I think this is probably the least controversial, most interesting, and most useful CEO transition I've seen in a while. And so the fact that the stock is getting whacked on that only makes me more interested in buying more. As 
As always, people on the program may own stocks mentioned. The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear. I'm Ricky Mulvey. Thanks for listening. We'll be back tomorrow.